What have we got this time? Okay, this time I have brought for you the most incomplete book that I've ever brought. This is an actual printed page from the Gutenberg Bible, the very first printed book. Well, there was printing before Gutenberg's printing press, but those all sucked. <laughs> this time I think I brought Rick something really unbelievable. It's a single leaf from the Gutenberg Bible. It's really the first substantial printed book uh, in the history of the world. So we have a leaf here, which is a page. This is one page from the Gutenberg Bible. You may ask why there is only one page. In the 1920s, a famous book dealer named Gabriel Wells came upon an incomplete copy of the Gutenberg Bible, and he broke it up into single pages, and he put it with a bibliographical essay, and he had it very beautifully browned, and he sold them as single pages where he puts a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible, and in the approximate years that they believe it was printed, is it printed on the other side? Yeah, it's a double-sided leaf. It's printed on very fine paper that they imported from Italy into Germany in the period. And it's been hand rubricated with colors with red and blue after it's been printed so that it looked more like a manuscript. That's pretty amazing. The Gutenberg Bible to this day is regarded as one of the most beautifully printed books. He had to invent the type. He had to invent the press that it went in into. He had to invent the ink. It was a massive undertaking. It's like the internet to think how quickly they went from printing a book like this to having people copy the invention, to go throughout Europe, setting up printing centers all through Europe within 50 years. It literally was like the internet. It went from this to scientific books, to fiction, to dirty pictures, to uh, a little bit of everything. And well, there's no more important invention in the history of democracy than the printing press, because it's the democratization of knowledge. It puts the power of knowledge into the hands of the people. And you found this in one of your travels? Well, this came from an estate. It originally belonged to a printer, and I bought it from the estate. I mean, I was beyond thrilled to find it. This particular leaf is from the Old Testament. It's from the second book of Chronicles, which is towards the end of the Hebrew Bible. And it talks about the purification of the temple in Jerusalem. Cool. OK, so the big question, how much you want for it? I came up with a number, and you better brace yourself, but remember the importance of the book, of $65,000 for the page. OK. Like always, I'm gonna call Rebecca. Um, let me get her down here. Oh, this I, is. Uh, I would be delighted. She's gonna be. I, I mean, think she'll be flawed to see it. Sixty-five thousand dollars. Adam is a regular customer of mine that sells me things on a regular basis. He brought in a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible, and it's absolutely amazing. But he wants sixty-five thousand dollars, and it would be a sin if I didn't make a profit on this thing. So I'm calling in Rebecca. Hello. The world's most famous book person meets the world's most famous book. <laughs> is that what I think it is? It's a page of it. <laughs> right, a leaf. A page to me, a leaf to you. Well, a page is actually one side and then the other, so it's two pages, one leaf. All right, you got me, okay. Well, the most important thing is it's a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible. Yeah, and I just touched it. The Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> I just touched okay. it. So when was the last complete Gutenberg Bible sold? The, the right. full set hasn't been sold since the 70s. Yeah, it's been decades upon decades. Okay, and yeah. in the meantime, other books have gone for over $10 million. I mean, this would just be astronomical. It would break all the records. So the thing is, is it real? Can I hold it up to the light? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. I've seen Gutenberg Bibles before, but I don't think that I've had a chance at this length to really inspect one. Like, this is a chance that most people are never going to get, even rare book specialists. I would touch it, but I'm afraid I'd catch on fire. <laughs> I'm holding it up to the light so that I can see the chain lines that you see in handmade paper that comes specifically from paper of this period. It's real, correct? Yes. OK. What's it worth? Dealers I know and trust, they're going to place this around $80,000. Uh, so I think that is fair to ask for the way things are looking right now in the market. You're the best. Yep, happy to help. Well, thanks so much, Rebecca. I really yep. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So you heard from your friend and eminent book expert. 
So how much would you be willing to go? Of all the business we've done over the years, and like... You I mean, give me a number what you're comfortable with. 40,000. I can't do 40 on it. I mean, I mean that, that's what I feel comfortable with. Auctions yeah. are definitely not an exact science. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, 40,000 is just so on the lowest scale in terms of what I can, I can take for it. I mean, I didn't even want to come down so low, but 55. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be fair with you, Rick. I, I, and I know you are. I would go 45,000. That's the best I could do. I'm going to offer it to you for 47,000, and it would be foolish for you to say no. And that is a price I did not imagine I would even agree to. I have a CFO in an office right down the hallway that's going to be really mad at me. So 47, we got to do. You're not going to be mad when you make <laughs> make a small fortune. Um, on it. it's amazing. Uh, I'll meet you right up front. Let me get someone to keep an eye on this, and I'll do some paperwork. But why do you need someone to keep an eye? It's only a page. No, it's two pages. It's one leaf. Oh, uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I now own a page of the Gutenberg Bible. What can I help you with? I have a Cardinals ring I'd like to sell you. Baseball or football? Neither. This kind. Oh, this kind. That's right. I think I did that right. <laughs> <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to try to sell my 19th century Cardinals ring. I recently acquired it from a friend of mine. It's not anything I'd ever wear, and I'd rather have the money. My bottom dollar is 6,300 bucks. The value is in its role in history. This is supposedly from a cardinal? Supposedly from a cardinal. It's from the 19th century, and we know that because of the jeweler, a gentleman by the name of Fromont Marie. You'll see his name on there. Fromont Maurice is a big name in jewelry. They even have really exquisite pieces that are in the Louvre. If this was manufactured by them, it's worth a lot more money. Why do you think it's a cardinal's ring? One of the gemologists that I took it to to do some research on it indicated that it had to be some type of religious icon. Cardinals, I know there's over 100 of them. Yeah. And um, I think their official title is like they're a prince of Rome. Mm -hmm. You know what the center stone is? It's a garnet, I believe. It could be a garnet, yeah. It could be um, a sapphire. Sapphires come in every single color in the rainbow. So how much do you want for it? Well, for the ring itself, I'd love to get 6,000. Okay. I've been told by the gemologists that appraise it is that they're not the highest quality stones. I'm not trying to represent or sell this on the basis of the stone. The value is the value in antiquity, it's value in history. But the thing is, I have to verify that it's actually a cardinal's ring. See, I have faith, because I've had the ring in my possession. If it's a cardinal's ring, I mean, it's definitely going to add a lot of value on top of everything else. Let me go give someone a call. I'll get him down here, find out if it's a cardinal's ring. OK. Sounds good, sir. All right, I'll be right back. Thank you. If he tells me the ring didn't belong to a cardinal, I would really be surprised. But the thing I have going for me is the craftsman. That's what I'm going to try to sell. Mark! How are you doing? I'll just live in the dream. <laughs> <laughs> so what have we got today? The supposed cardinal's ring. Really? I'm the administrator of the Clark County Museum system, and I specialize in any form of historical artifact. OK, the ring of office in the Catholic Church goes back to the 7th century AD, when they started officially saying, this is how we're going to recognize your office. The pope presents you with a ring. It's a big deal. If this is actually the ring worn by a cardinal, that's an unusual piece. A cardinal normally is buried with their ring. To have an actual cardinal's ring would be an extraordinary piece to have come in here. So what's your concerns about it? My big concern is, is it a cardinal's ring? I do know that there are certain things to look for. Today, when a ring is given to a new cardinal, the ring's design is approved by the pope. Every cardinal that's being raised to cardinal at the same time gets the same ring. And so there's a continuity of ring design. In the 19th century, that wasn't necessarily the case. So one of the things that you want to find is some sign of the church and some sign of papal authority. In the 19th century, any ring coming from the pope would have most likely the crossed keys of St. Peter's on it. In here, you've got a very nice cross, almost a Maltese cross on both sides. Unfortunately, that's all you see. There is no other symbology of the Pope on this ring. So it is probably not a ring of office. 
Probably not a ring of office for a cardinal or for a bishop? For a bishop, for a cardinal, for either. For the ring to be the ring of office, that's the only ring that counts. This would have had other symbology on it, mm -hmm. and it just does not. Okay. Thanks, man. You're the best. Alrighty. Thank you. It's really disappointing that the Pope's mark is not on this thing, but we still have an antique ring from a famous jewelry house, so I'm still interested. Before I make an offer, I want to go test the stones, look at them underneath a microscope, and if everything's cool, um, I'm going to come back and make an offer. All right. All right, I'll be right back. Thank you. I'm digging this thing, but old doesn't necessarily mean valuable. I got to get in the lab and figure out what kind of stones we're talking about here. Hey, Jeff, you got your clothes on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what kind of stone is that? I'm the precious gemstone expert here at the pawn shop. I identify gemstones using a variety of different lab equipment. Each gemstone has different growth patterns and identifying characteristics. So what I'm trying to find is inclusions that are very indicative of what gemstone they are. So what do we got? This is a Hessenite Groschlerite garnet. It's a garnet. Yes, orange garnet. That's what they call an orange garnet? Uh, is a Hessenite? Hessenite, uh, most of them. They have different varieties and species. Emeralds on the side, right? Yes. All right, thanks. Now that I know what the stones are in this ring, making an offer will be easier. But I do need to take into account the entire ring, not just the stones. All right, um, it's a garnet. Those are emeralds. Okay. Just so you know, my jewelers in the back can make this ring for under $1,000. But we do have the manufacturer. And shoot me an offer. 1500 bucks. Whew. OK, this is a really famous manufacturer. But the stuff of his that goes for big money is really elaborate pieces. We won't do 1500 And what's the best you can do? The best I can do is 2000 period. The other problem with this ring is a big problem on a ring. It's unsizable. Most rings, they leave a simple piece of gold on the back. There's no decorations on it. Mm -hmm. You can cut and size that. That you can't. The decoration goes all the way around. $2,000, I'm not going to go up any more. Well, I'll probably be more blessed having the 2000 than I will having the ring, so you got a deal. Apparently, you're blessed. Thank you, sir. OK, I'll meet you right up there. 2000 is a lot less than what I was trying to get but it's better than nothing, and I'm happy with it. Hey, how can I help you? I have some what I think are very interesting items. OK. <laughs> that I don't think you maybe have ever seen before. These are papal slippers. They belonged to Pope Leo XIII. We're comfortable with me, Rick. <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my slippers and cap that belong to Pope Leo the Thirteenth. I inherited them about 20 years ago. I want to sell them, but I don't know what they could possibly be worth or if someone would even want to pay money for them. Where in the world did you get these? My aunt was a nun, and I was helping clean out some of her closets. And I said, Auntie, what's in this cute little suitcase? She said, oh, just some slippers that belonged to Pope Leo the 13th. And do you know anything about him? He was Pope from 1878 until 1903 when he died. And he had the third longest papacy in Pope history. I'm just still sort of overwhelmed. Pope Leo was definitely up there on the list of famous popes. He thought science and religion should coexist which was pretty controversial at the time. W what else do we have? Uh, we also have the cap that was worn by Pope Leo the 13th. OK. That's a big wow factor right there. Uh, we also have um, his stockings. I'm amazed. We just don't get stuff like this walking through the door every day. Um, yeah. You got the Pope's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, I mean. Did she tell you how she got them or anything like that? She just said it's a box full of Pope stuff? It's, there, there's some writing on the front of this box. It's hard to read, but um, it says brocade, uh, velvet brocade slippers said to have belonged to Pope Leo XIII. Uh, silk stockings, also his. Cap, also his, given to me some years ago by an Italian priest, Father Capiotani. And then it's signed and it's dated, it looks like 1937. What do you want to do with this stuff? Well, I would like to 
sell them. Well, we can stand here and talk all day about these slippers. We don't know a damn thing. Let's call somebody. Um, yeah. So let, let me go make a phone call. Like I said, rarely am I speechless, but this you is... You are this time. Let's go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. We get religious items in here all the time, but something that actually belonged to the Pope, I gotta assume these are really valuable. But how do you prove these were the Pope's? So check this out. That was supposedly owned by the Pope, Leo the Thirteenth. The Pope's right. shoes, the Pope's hat. Pope's all right. His socks. This is interesting. Leo the Thirteenth. he served as Pope from 1878 to 1903. He was very influential in how the Catholic Church was changing at that point. At that point, the Catholic Church was under siege in Italy. There was a huge anti-clerical, anti-church movement. He's the first pope that was ever filmed, and he's the first pope that we have on tape. He's the first pope that you can actually hear him speaking. If these are actually his, they are significant. The pope is probably one of the top moral authorities in the world. This is a position that doesn't have a lot of temporal power, but he has moral power. And we have seen popes who have made enough of a difference that entire governments have changed. Okay, well, let's take a look at them. The popes used a particular type of slipper that was consistent for oh, about 500 years. The construction appears absolutely correct. They had a, a leather sole. The uppers would be velvet like this. Oh, well, this is good. It's it's a satin interior. It's handmade. It's it's gold threading on it, all of which is is correct. Now the Tsucheta, I can tell, is not in the best of shape. The problem here is that Tsucheta is done with silk, and at the turn of the century, in order for silks to fall correctly, the silk was treated with metallic salts. <gasps> and what happens if the salts cut the threads? Mm. You can see this surface layer has almost completely disintegrated. The inner lining is a very soft kid leather, and that would make sense. All right, so what do you think? Did these belong to the Pope? I hate to do that to you. They're they're the right time period. They're made right. My I would give it about a 75% yes. Okay. You know? It's it's a problem that you run into when you've got something that's that belonged to somebody. You know, unless you've got that person having written their name in it. A lot of times it's real hard to say absolutely. This is exactly what I was afraid of. This is one of the coolest things to walk in my shop in a while, but there's just no way to prove they're real. And the thing is, I really do believe her story. W what did you want for him? To be honest, I don't know. What do you think, Rick? You know what? I normally don't do this, but I'm gonna pass. I mean, it's... You know, I, I can't get a definitive answer on this stuff, but I have to guarantee this stuff when I sell it. Sure. Thanks Thank for bringing it Thank you so me. much. You're welcome. My Thank pleasure. Thank you, young lady. Well, obviously, we didn't make a deal, but I learned a ton about them. I feel really good about the expert's opinion, so someday I would love to sell them and cash in on that inheritance. Ciao. Buongiorno. Si. Grazie. What are you doing? I'm learning Italian. Why would you be learning Italian? Because when I'm in Italy, I want to be able to communicate with the locals. You're going to Italy. Yes, I'm going to Italy. I recently bought a Zacchetto, which is the little cap the Pope wears. I have to get it authenticated, Rick, you know? That's the right thing to do, that's the next step. So, I've been inspired to go to Italy. I'll be off very shortly. You know what, that actually sounds like fun, because remember the philosophy guy I was telling you about earlier? Rebecca found a lead a first edition book by Giordano Bruno that I've been wanting forever that she says is in a bookstore in Italy. We'll cruise around Rome, it'll be fun. So now you're going to Italy too? Oh yes. I wanna go to Italy. But who's gonna run the store? You don't need to go to Italy, you don't have any business out there. Okay, all right, here's the reality of the situation, son. I can go to Italy, 
chump can go to Italy. We can go to Italy with each other. But I can't go to Italy with you because that way Chum would have to run the store and we know that can't happen. So you can't go, we can go. So basically because he's incompetent, I can't go on vacation. Yep. That's it. And I'm going to Italy. <laughs> Man, you guys suck. Uh, you've already booked your trip? I've got it all booked, yes, ready to go. Okay, well give me your flight info, I'll see if they have any first class tickets. And um, I don't think we'll be sitting together. <laughs> I've been dreaming about taking a European vacation for a long time. And finally, Rick and I made it to Italy. There's so many things I want to do here, but as always, it's business before pleasure. Back in Vegas, I bought a skull cap worn by a pope known as Zacchetto. Part of this trip is to prove to Rick that I made a good purchase, but the other part is so I could have a Roman holiday. All right, Rick, I know you're sick of walking around the city, so I got you a van on your company card, don't worry. And we're gonna go get this Zacchetto checked out. You're gonna be really proud of me once you realize how well I did. This wasn't a lot of money, was it? I don't know, I put it on your credit card. So this Zucchetto inspired Chum for this Roman holiday. He paid over $3,000 for it. He did not get it authenticated or anything. And apparently he has found someone who can authenticate it. So we'll see what happens. All right, Rick, you're about to see the reason we came here. Father Josh. Chum Lee, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for meeting me today. Glad to meet with you. How's it going? I'm Rick. Father Josh, good seeing you. Welcome to the Eternal City. I'm Father Joshua Rodrig. I'm assistant professor of theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. I received a phone call from Chum Lee, and he has an item belonging to Pope Pius XII, and so he wanted me to meet up with him today here in Rome to authenticate that item. You know, I called you down because yes. I wanted you to look at this uh, zucchetto. Okay. Do you know what a zucchetto is? I was told it was a zucchini. <laughs> yes, that's, well, you know, you're not too far from, from the mark. The zucchetta, the name zucchetta comes from actually the word zucca, which is Italian for pumpkin. And you can sort of see that it looks like the top of a pumpkin. And it comes from the early times when they had what was called tonsuring, which was they cut a piece of hair off the top of the head. Think of like the friar tuck look. Okay. And so it was mainly to protect the shaved head from the elements. We don't do that anymore unless some of us are blessed with a natural tonsure. I feel that, yeah. It's the reason he wears his hat. <laughs> That's why hats are there, to protect us. What was Pope Pius XII known for? Well, he was really known as uh, the Pope during World War II. Uh, he came in to his pontificate in 1939, so all during World War II, he was sort of holding things together, really, in Rome. Okay, so was that Pope Pius XII's Zucchetto. Wait a second, I have this letter here. Well, no, this is, uh, it's from the Anticamera Pontificia. Essentially, it's the papal chambers, and it's signed by the Cameriere Segreto Participante, which translates into the participating secret waiter. This isn't the guy that's gonna bring, you know, pasta to the Pope and all that. <laughs> so he would be the one that would wait with dignitaries that were coming to meet the Pope. So the document is, is correct. Okay. And the, uh, the zucchetto itself, usually you can tell by the type of cloth that's used is sort of a watered silk. And usually you'd find that with the Holy Father. And so um, no doubt that this would belong to Pope Pius XII. That's good news. We got an amazing zucchetto from Pope Pius XII himself. Okay, pretty amazing. Do you know how much this would be worth? Well, normally with relics, we don't, we don't sell relics because of you know just the sacred value of it. However, after you had called, I had done some research to look and see what, you know, you would find in an auction. And Sirius Pope Pius XII, more or less $3,500. Okay. Well, you heard the man. Father says this is a holy relic. It's worth more than I paid for it, but I don't think we're going to be able to sell this, Rick. I think we're going to have to put this on display in our shop. <laughs> I really appreciate the right? trouble you coming out and everything No like problem. That. All right. Thank you, Father. Um, Good seeing y'all. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the city. If you get to Vegas, come and see us. <laughs> I'll go for the buffets. <laughs> Vegas is no place for a father. Maybe Chum did purchase this for the right price, but I would suggest that he maybe keep it with him and maybe let Pope Pius XII intercession sort of help him out throughout life. So I'm in Rome and I'm on a mission. 
Rebecca has told me about a rare bookstore here that might have a first edition of a book by Giordano Bruno, The Martyr of Science. I've been looking for one of his books for my entire life. He was a radical thinker whose theories threatened the Catholic Church. They ended up ordering all of his books destroyed, so only a few exist anywhere in the world. Giordano Bruno, he was the first one to say that the universe is infinite, and the church did not like any of that. So in 1600, he was burnt at the stake right where I'm standing. He's been a hero of mine forever. So I'm going to the store. Hopefully they have it and I can make a deal. If we do, this will be the greatest vacation of my life. Wow. Hello. Hi. Welcome to my bookshop. Hey, how's Hello. it going? Nice uh, to meet you. I was recommended to you by a friend of mine, so. Okay. We have okay. something interesting. My bookstore is a family business and is a bookshop since uh, 100 years. We find all our books in private collections, very well preserved and very, very rare. What do you got? We can start uh, an early edition of Machiavelli, The Prince. That'd be pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah. Oh, whoa. No. <laughs> uh, so what year is this? In, in Venice, 1544. This is pretty amazing. Every tyrant should read this. This is how you maintain your power. We still use the term in the States. Very Machiavellian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how much is something like this? Uh, 6,000 euros. Okay. That's pretty amazing. But the main reason I'm here is I heard you have a first edition Giordano Bruno. Yes. Maybe it's the best piece in my bookshop. <laughs> Can I see it? Sure. It's here, under key. <laughs> This is the Giordano Bruno. Ah, Giordano Bruno. The Giordano Bruno is a very, very rare first edition, printed in 1587. I think uh, there will be 50 copies known. This book is very, very rare. This is a beautiful edition. This is Latin. The progress of the hunter's lamp uh, of logical methods. Yeah. This is a small treatise. More on the logical method, the scientific method. For years and years, I've always wanted a book by him. This guy believed that the stars were suns and planets went around them. I mean, this was before telescopes he was coming up with this stuff. And this was forbidden knowledge. You know, he was going against the teachings of the Catholic Church. They ordered all of his books burnt. Yeah. And to be caught with one of these books, it was a really, really bad thing. They got rid of all the books, and very, very few of them remained. The last one I saw the, of this that sold was like 1903? Yeah, 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 I found it, yeah. God, this is pretty amazing. All right, the big question. Yeah. How much do you want for it? You are American, so let's talk in dollar. 120,000. Um, I was thinking more like $80,000? No, I can't. I'm sorry. It's impossible at this. Um, I mean, what, what would be your best price? Let's do 110. It's the best I can do. You could, you could do 100,000. It's a small book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will give you $100,000 for it. Let's do this deal. All right, um, $100,000. Um, $100,000. This has been an amazing day. I am gonna go get the wire transfer figured out. I would shop more, but I don't have any more money to spend. <laughs> it's been an amazing day. I paid a lot for it, but I don't care. This has been something I've been looking for for years. And now I'm gonna go have a glass of Italian wine and celebrate. Hey, Corey. What's up, Adam? How you Good. doing? Good, how's it going? Where's your dad? Uh, he took off somewhere with Chum. Why? What's up? Ah, I uh, dragged in a, another book for him. You're gonna have to buy it then. Uh, what is it? Well, you've heard of uh, Geneva watches, right? Yeah. Well, this is the Geneva Bible. It's a Protestant Bible printed in the year 1583. You know, King Henry basically decided that he wanted a divorce and they wouldn't give it to him, so he basically ended Catholicism in England and started his own religion because he hated his wife that much. Men have been known to do a lot of things for women. Yeah, um, I can't imagine hating somebody that much. <laughs>
My name is Adam. I'm coming back to the pawn shop today with a really interesting 16th century English Bible. It's known as the Geneva Bible. It's a really fascinating relic of history and an important book. So I'm asking $1,600. I mean, every copy is unique, and I think that's a reasonable and fair price for it. I don't think I've had one of these in here yet. Can I touch it or? Yeah, absolutely. Go These ahead. things always scare me because they're fragile. Protestantism flourished in England, but then Mary came to the throne in 1553, and she wanted to revert England back to Catholicism. She banned these Bibles being printed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Didn't she burn out all the Protestants' eyes or something? Bloody Mary, that's it. You, you probably know the drink for sure. I mean, she definitely tortured and persecuted a lot of uh, Protestants. So the Protestants fled to Geneva, which was a refuge for them. And for the first time, really, they translated the entire Bible out of the original languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, into an English Bible. And this was the first really accessible Bible that people could read in the English language. So for being that old, I mean, it's in pretty good shape, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got some condition flaws, for sure. OK. What are you looking to get out of it? I'm looking for a very modest price, I think. It's like 1600 bucks for it. <sighs> They're still rare and desirable because it's an interesting Bible and it's so famous and it has such importance in history. I mean, if your dad was here, he would grab that in a second from me. Um, God, I wish I knew more about this stuff. But let me give Rebecca a call and have her come down and take a look at it. Cool, thanks a lot. That can only help me. She's extremely knowledgeable, and she's going to emphasize the importance and history of the Bible to him. I hope that's enough to sway him. I heard something about a Bible. When it comes to books, she's the word of God. All right, so what is it? I just don't know. I mean, I know it's a Geneva Bible. I know about Bloody Mary. I know about King Henry. But what a Bible's worth these days, I just don't know. I'm really glad Corey called me down. He seemed so lost. One thing that we take for granted is that the Bible being translated into English was a revolutionary act for hundreds of years that would get you burnt at the stake. And this revolution affected our English language culture. I mean, this is the Bible that Shakespeare used. I mean, it is kind of funny that they printed it in English in a country where they don't speak English. They actually used smuggling networks to get it into England. So this was contraband. All for a book. That said, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Oh, yeah, it's, right? it's a complicated book. I know. <laughs> That's a very nice way to put it, Adam. First, the obvious thing is we've got the rebacking. So it's been repaired? Yeah, it's just a front joint repair, it looks like. It's a little bit crude, I admit. I'm sorry, this repair job, it's so awful. Now let's concentrate on the importance of the Bible and the history. On the one hand, I like these little notes here. This was actually a, a study Bible, and they made little notations in the margins. Yeah, in some ways, those notes were what really upset other theologians, because there's a lot of, like, Protestant philosophy in there that people took issue with. I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> So, Adam, I know you know that this is somewhat common as far as rare books go. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was hoping it would be an impulse purchase. It would have to be in this condition. Sure. So what do you think it's worth? OK. I like the provenance. I like the history. But like, there's just so many other things that are a problem. I think, optimistically, you could try to ask 1500 for it. But let's try it this way. Should I buy it? No. No, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to pass. This is the first time you completely shot me down. I can't <laughs> believe it. Maybe she'll buy you lunch, because I'm not buying your Bible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor, poor Bible. The Bible has some issues, but we all have issues. I'm not going to be standing on a street corner, though, reading verses from it.